immediately. Um, so good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this special, special Carnegie Mellon Mumbai interview with Kunal Shah, founder of Cred. My name is Ashay Doshi, and I'll be hosting today's interview, along with Anup Doshi, who will be running Q&A. Uh, before we start, I want to invite Rekha Koita to say a few words of welcome to Kunal, as well as all our guests. So Rekha. Thank you, Ashay. And uh, thank you, Kunal, for joining us today. I mean, we're really excited to have you here. And I also want to thank all our attendees for taking time out, uh, you know, uh, today. Uh, it's a Thursday evening, and I'm really happy to see all of you here. I'm sure you will uh, find this uh, session really interesting. I personally uh, also just want to say that I think this topic, right, for financial literacy and inclusion is something which is so important. And I mean, it's to me personally, it's very close to my heart because I think it's something which is really required in our country, definitely, and across all socioeconomic strata. So I have seen so many people, especially women from the marginalized communities where I work to the more elite women, right, get into trouble due to lack of, uh, you know, this whole financial literacy. So I think I personally feel very strongly about it and I'm really happy to kind of, uh, you know, have Kunal on board here and really looking forward to hearing, uh, hearing you. So let me just hand it back to Ashe. And Ashe, thank you for all your effort, as always, in curating uh, this session. And thank you to Anu for helping out. Thank you, Rekha. And Kunal, like Rekha mentioned, we are in extremely exciting digital and financial times today. 80% uh, of the country has bank accounts. Uh, UPI is recording 2 billion transactions a month. But now the question is, how do we take it to the next level as a country in terms of financial literacy, inclusion, sophistication of financial instruments? Uh, so for everyone, Kunal needs no introduction. He's the founder of Cred that processes around 25 to 27% of India's credit card payments today. It has a user base of 7.5 million users with credit scores above 750. Uh, Kunal, you've also been a founder at Free Charge earlier, uh, which you sold for $450 million dollars. Kunal has been financially independent since he was 16, which is amazing. And he's also an angel investor with 200 startups. So today we're going to talk about financial literacy. Uh, before we start, Kunal, I uh, would love for you to give a few words of welcome to our community. And thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, uh, these are exciting times and, and uh, every exciting times are also confusing times. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, if you guys are feeling uh, a strong sense of irrelevance, uh, I, I must say that uh, the feeling is mutual. Uh, every single person should be feeling that uh, because the world is changing at a rate faster than our ability to understand, our ability to react, and our ability to adapt. Uh, happy to keep this session to be more interactive. My biggest worry remains financial literacy because uh, world has become like a superconductor uh, where information, ideas, money can seamlessly move between uh, geographies, people in a way we have never imagined before. And in these times, if you do not really understand how money works and how money compounds and how wealth works, uh, we are likely to get disrupted in manners we can never, never imagine. Uh, and nobody's safe. Uh, right. And I think the bigger challenge is that for most people who are uh, poor, they struggle with financial literacy, but I have seen that even the most smartest people in this country who seem to have high income also right. have terrible financial literacy. And we are not likely to recover from these situations. A lot of times we realize that, oh, uh, just because we make more income, we'll have more wealth uh, right. that is not necessarily true. Uh, uh, and I think we are in a time where everything looks perfect, everything looks interesting, but the fact is India's per capita income has dropped in the last two years. Yep. Bangladesh's per capita income has grown dramatically in the last six, seven years, even beating India, which means very soon Indians will be seen to be moving to Bangladesh uh, and they will be throwing us out. Uh, as well as a median and, income as well, right? Uh, yeah, the per capita uh, on, on all basis has gone up. Uh, less than 6% of urban Indian women have financial independence and income in India. That number right. is 
nearly 68 to 70 percent uh, uh, in that market. So uh, we we tend to be. I I have a strong feeling that India and especially a lot of us Indians are especially delusion uh, in understanding macroeconomic situation and data. Right. And, right. and financial literacy seems to be the need of the hour, not from uh, the bottom and thinking that, okay, we need to teach our mid and drivers. I think most of us are completely right. caught off guard over here. And just because we've invested something in the stock market and had some built some wealth doesn't mean we'll be able to uh, keep that wealth if we don't Absolutely. understand how basics work. Absolutely. I think that's uh, that those are some very startling stats. And in addition to per capita income, our median income is also only $600. So that is something that is super worrying. So Kunal, let's jump straight into it. In uh, one of your articles, you said, you know, the engine of financial inclusion needs the oil of financial literacy. We have 27% people who are financially literate in the country, according to RBI. So this is my hypothesis, and you can poke holes in it, is that our judiciary system, we've never been able to, we have too many cases outstanding. Too many, too few judges, too many lawyers, and people rely on their own relations and own society and community for financial decisions because of that. So, why do you think we are so good at math and bad at money, culturally? Uh, because we think they are one and the same when they are not. Number one. Number two, we never discuss that in the family, uh, except a few business families. Most of the country never discusses money. Uh, right. uh, it is considered to be a topic which is almost taboo. Uh, people silently suffer in debt, uh, don't necessarily understand how. And, and uh, because female independence of finance is less, uh, men tend to take a lot more risky behavior uh, right. because women do not have equal control on finances. If you look at everywhere, uh, women tend to be ones who build uh, build households, build families, build uh, more more stable wealth options. Correct. Men naturally have a tendency of finding one or the other version of taking high risk uh, bets, which may not may not be ideal to grow. Uh, so I think my view is that uh, we we've been terrible at some of these things because uh, a it's not discussed. We've never had this in our school. Uh, I can bet my life that majority of salaried employees will not know what is inflation and how right. does it impact their life. The retail uh, inflation. I, I can, and, and I don't think they're likely to even understand what is the uh, 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 impact of inflation on their saving account. Majority, uh, uh, one scary fact is that 70 to 80% of wealth uh, retail deposit, which is between saving account and finance, uh, fixed deposits, uh, it's stuck in 30 million accounts, which has majority of the money. Uh, I would say even 60, 70% of all retail deposits are in just 30 million accounts. And wow. most of the salaried people are not investing, keeping the money in the saving account uh, and not realizing that inflation is much more. Like my, my guess is urban inflation is probably at seven, 8%. Uh, right. And if you're earning two, two and a half percent, three percent in your bank account, your wealth is going down every single year without you realizing it. Correct. And these concepts were not taught because we were told to become good at math, engineering, or doctor banna hai, but uh, we thought commerce and uh, accounting and personal finance are topics for commerce students to do. Right. But the right. problem right. is even commerce students don't understand what it means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Akshay, yeah. I, 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 I have a feedback. When you're speaking and acknowledging, I get three echoes, so I get like disrupted. So. Maybe, maybe stay on mute when I'm speaking because it's just uh, very jarring. Sorry for that. Sounds good. I'll, I'll stay on mute. Um, but just to add on to that, Kunal, where uh, the Gurukul system was concerned, I studied undergrad in the US and I was talking to my professors, Mujhe business padna. I'm, I'm a business undergrad student. Why am I studying philosophy? Why am I studying media classes? He said, we've actually adopted your Gurukul system and modernized it. So what needs to change on a content level in terms of education, like the new NEP, new education policy, to infuse capitalism and financial literacy into the curriculum? Well, first of all, start talking about it. I, I think the first thing that can be done is parents talk about these topics uh, with their kids. And 
through that at least understand if they know enough uh, if they can teach their kids we can assume that they are in a safe place most people can't tell their kids what difference between capitalism and socialism is uh, uh, and i can say that for majority of indians we don't understand what capitalism is uh, uh we don't understand if mrp is a good thing or a bad thing if you ask the most smartest people smartest businessmen they'll say you mrp is a good thing but they don't understand that then they don't understand what is capitalism right uh, why is person saying in valkeshwar paying the same for bislari like somebody who's staying in uh, let's say a slums of dharavi it doesn't make sense but we have mrp and, and the benefit of that is not really going to the poor it's going to the rich and we don't understand these things right so my my view is that uh these are deeper issues uh uh and and uh i don't think anybody really has spent time to deeply understand what capitalism is i think we are we, we all of us have a deep blood of socialism and trying to play the game of capitalism which makes the game slightly harder um uh, also what i have noticed is that uh in curriculum to be included first we have to accept that capitalism is the way to go and we have to accept that money is important and not a taboo topic that we should be ashamed to talk about and not just calculate compound interest but talk about interest Im- impact of compound interest on your life right uh beyond that uh i think making it a mainstream conversation right uh unlimited movies have been made on autobiographies of athletes and artists and how many businessmen's biography have we have made uh how many of us know history of let's say top 500 businessmen of india and 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 historically how they created wealth we have no clue right uh, I, i'll give you a fun fact i don't know if you know about this but do do you know the story of raja bai tower ashay which is raja bai tower yeah i mean i am based on yeah yeah uh, it is at bombay university has raja bai tower next to it the big tower next to it Correct. which is opposite a uh, maidan raja bai tower the big ben built, yeah raja bai tower was built by Premchand Roychan uh he used to be the richest person in India at one point of time almost uh, the large most richest broker in the world uh and and he was also the founder of Bombay Stock Exchange and he made the tower by spending millions of dollars at that point of time uh for his mom Raja Bai who could not see and she, she had to do 6 pm chauvyar as per jains and to her time he made that clock for her now how many indians and how many peak gujaratis would know about this uh because we've never continued these stories but we know story about every artist every athlete so the question is how many like are our civilian awards given to businessmen uh, is that something that is of uh, celebration or not uh and i think this is uh, uh by the way interesting thing i found out while i was reading some interesting article by devdutt patnaik he said that the word vaishya and word vaishya actually has the same origin so we tend to attribute people who do business to be of a lower order uh and and that is deeply cultural absolutely and uh, now that you mention it i can only remember guru as a movie that you know glorifies uh, businessmen otherwise it's mostly been The movies of the seventies always painted the businessman as the bad guy. And, yeah, uh, even now, like like the series that becomes hit on business is Scam ninety two. But what about all the people who have created millions of jobs? What about people who have made hospital chains? What about people who have created millions of jobs for uh, uh, organized or uh, unorganized players? So the question is that these are not interesting stories for us. Absolutely, and uh, it's funny. So I work in agriculture, an agriculture startup. Two weeks ago, I was in Pandarpur, which is you know small town, and the local MLA had the number plate of five 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 five. So you saw eighty percent of the cars on the road ended with five five. Eighty percent of the cars on the road were white in color, and people wore white. So I think our priorities yeah. on who we worship has. It is true. Uh, by the way, if you go to Indonesia, it's exactly the opposite. Every car is black because all the MLA's cars over there are black. Are you on mute? Yeah, I thought it was a very interesting dichotomy that we don't worship our wealth creators. I think you also mentioned in Portugal where you saw Vasco da Gama statue in the church because he was an explorer. But Indians, we are we are we glorify superstars, we glorify politicians, 
but I think hopefully with the next generation, I know you're a legend on Twitter. So hopefully, you know, people start uh, respecting and revering that. I, I, I think we have a long way to go. Uh, I don't think uh, it can be solved magically. For example, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, it, it's not so easy to now get married, uh, and especially in an arranged marriage situation. Uh, and, and they're except in business communities where it is appreciated and respected. Uh, unless we solve the society's cultural DNA saying that, first of all, we still have 90, 95% arranged marriages. I don't know why, but it continues to exist. In arranged marriages, I don't think parents are going to, uh, especially if you are a, 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 getting a daughter married, would prefer to have somebody who has unstable path ahead of them, right? So by desire, we are systematically looking for more stable jobs. So the desire for government jobs is going to remain systematically high because you believe that you are less likely to have a, a good successful marriage or be able to marry somebody well, if depending on that. So it's a very complex equation to be solved. Uh, I, and, and especially with like 95% of urban women not contributing to the workforce and having independent income, the need to find a more stable partner is going to be pronounced which will again stop entrepreneurship. So the, 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 the rabbit hole goes quite deep. Absolutely. And I was actually, our previous interview last month was with Devjani Ghosh of NASCOM. And she spoke about them running large scale reskilling and upskilling programs for women for you know digital training, AI, ML. Um, you've spoken a lot about brain drain, like you know, smartest people are leaving the country. Do you think we have that scale and potential to teach the raw talent that exists in the country get women back to working in the workforce? And what is the government role in that to implement to get women in the workforce? Asha, let me ask you a question. What percentage of your classmates, female classmates in your college are currently having their independent income right now? I would say it would be around say 40% given- 40%? Yeah. That seems very high by the way, that is great. Uh, you think the 60% were not skilled? Oh, no, I don't think they were not skilled. I just think they so, dropped out. So of the, the question is that, are we culturally accepting somebody who's more educated to be out there in the workforce? A lot of people who do MBA and start taking care of the kids because the family thinks that, why would you leave your kid alone and do a job problem care life? Mein? And the thing is that we are systematically slowing down growth of women by kind of guilt tripping them uh, in name of family, kids, all of that. And, and yes, they are likely to naturally fall for that because imagine you are a 10% crowd that is working right now. And there's a parent teacher meeting that is organized in the middle of the day. So what are you likely to feel about yourself and your kid? Then I'm not a good mother. But fathers are excluded from parent teacher meeting. So we have created a caste system without realizing that we have created a caste system. Absolutely. And that is extremely alarming. Um, you also spoke about, so even bank account usage, there's a gap of 11% between men and women. I think for credit specifically, getting more women into the financial system, the RBI estimates that if you address 100 million low-income women, there'll be 25,000 crores of new deposits in the financial system. So my, my terms of thinking is that a cult, like do businesses like cred take on the onus and startups or investing in education investing in universities to change this mindset how do we get out of this hole i don't know where to start to be very honest but i think starting early is important uh uh how many of us were taught anything about capitalism in i mean how many of you have, how many of us have studied capitalism for more than two hours in our entire life to, to know how this game is played. And all of us are playing the game of capitalism with no clue how this works, right? Uh, and, and, and therefore we have silly understanding of how money works or what are supposed to do. I think we can start with school. We can make an impact at uh, multiple levels in, in terms of interventions, even, even offices, right? Uh, it may not be a bad time to teach capitalism or wealth or how inflation works, right? Uh, all of the people who are attending over here, if I ask majority of your team members in your office, what is their understanding of inflation? How many of them will accurately know what is inflation and how does it impact their life, 
right? Uh, and and that is the bigger problem. How many of them would know clearly the correlation between inflation and uh, their bank deposit or fixed deposit? If you do not understand the correlation between bank deposit or fixed deposit and inflation, do you really think that you can change wealth? So I think there is a a bigger issue that needs to be taught. Uh, and 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 I'm not even talking about like say the mass India in the top hundred million Indians, which seem to be <laughs> of higher income group, and can speak English and and can communicate and and learn, even they and by the way, are graduates. Uh, uh, who have no clue how money works. So getting the uh, 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 unorganized uh, sector women to start having some income, that seems like a very long shot when majority of the people who are currently there, and, and we can't keep protecting people. Uh, if See, you can keep creating saying, hey, let's put this restriction, this rule, this uh, intervention by SEBI, this intervention by RBI, whatever. But what if people just don't know what is financial literacy, right? I was recently like coming across an article like Indians probably lose like 800 to 1000 crores to some Nigerian scams every year. So how do we stop it if people are not trained, right? It's like, you know, it's like basically the, you are not teaching the kid the uh, uh, importance of keeping safe when you are at a height to fall. But you're constantly creating new and new guardrails. But when the kid doesn't know, so they'll keep finding ways to again fall. Right. So are we supposed to teach the kid how to not fall, or keep creating all these guardrails so that they don't fall? I think that's a profound question. And to your point, I feel like even among my circles, the only solution to investing is FD me rakh do. But FD me six percent, seven percent you're getting versus your retail inflation goes to eight, nine percent. You're still losing money. So I think it runs much deeper into it. So do you think there's a lack of willingness to learn? Because Aj, if you really want to learn something, YouTube, uh, Stanford, MIT, financial, you can learn if you want to learn. But again, I'm traveling to tier two cities for my work. I ask my employees, the children, whole day they're on 4G, PUBG, games kill rare. But how do we balance this willingness to learn versus availability of learning and access? Uh, I wish I wish I knew good answers to that question. Uh, I, I just wish uh, what are the clean methods to do that? Uh, I think the okay. first thing is to uh, encourage understanding beyond curriculum. Let's put it this way, right? Let's say we are talking about kids for a second over here. Uh, we think anybody who shows random curiosity in our household who's young, we tell them, Are itna dimaag padhai mein lagega, full marks jayega. And there's constant shaming on random curiosity. So how do we expect them to be curious about anything? How many people who have invested in crypto know anything about crypto? Correct. And, and, and what do you think is going to be the impact when market severely corrects itself over there, will they know what to do or will they blame themselves and move on? Yep. I think with the new advertisements of coin DCX and all those coming up, I know so many people who've invested in crypto without having any idea. And you constantly mention uh, Israel as a topic where mothers asking children, like what is the most insightful question you asked in class today versus Ask kya kya, homework kya hai. And I was talking to Devjani Ghosh from NASCOM. She said, the mother in Israel wants the children to become a Nobel Prize winner. But in our it's like marks kitna hai, tuition jana hai. So I think it, that grassroots level change, well, what's your take on that? Uh, I don't think there is a problem about people have been focused on mark lana hai because they have seen that that gets the kids out of the middle class trap and makes them slightly more affluent. The problem is that do we have general curiosity? For example, there are two thing, things, three, two or three things that are problematic. As a culture, we do not allow 
any questioning to somebody who's elder or uh, with somebody with more status right ke tum bahut chote ho you are not supposed to speak amongst elders right and therefore most young people will never counter a stupid view on a whatsapp group of family uh, because they are fearful that their family will get upset about them trying to call out some nonsense right that's one two is do we really want to seek truth how many of us will be allowed to question religion or god or or how things work right uh, or question the covid protocols logic is not appreciated in many times right the third thing is uh, over a period of time if you have only demonstrated how to control young they will do the same thing to their young as well do you think a kid who has been over disciplined and told to not question will ever raise a kid which genuinely allows a lot of questioning and therefore most indians when they go to study abroad they are like i can't believe you learn this way i can't believe this is how you can ask a professor or you can question a professor or argue with them so we are long away long way to go from that and and i think most uh, uh people are just kind of unaware like lot of people still use the word yaar i'm not very good at tech can you do anything in future without being good at tech can you earn anything without being good at tech right i mean i mean you are a great example you are a ba in philosophy and an mba uh drop out from nm and now you created arguably one of the most uh, advanced tech companies in india so i think it comes down to the willingness to learn you mentioned something interesting about religion so i am gujarati as a you uh, when we were kids we were told to do parushan you know the fasting and everything and we always rebelled right kyu karna hai kya karna hai now we see a netflix documentary on intermittent fasting now everyone is following intermittent fasting even though my dadi and all of them already did it years ago so at some point i guess religion was used to scale good behavior and became dogmatic to a point i think we are at that place for something like financial literacy to how do you scale that by logic and explanation versus yahi karna hai or like you know you are forced to do this i think that is might be one of the big challenges i think uh there is a unique curse that all the people who even eventually become super evolved will have low birth rate and they start phasing out you will notice that a uh, strong correlation in people who get fully aware and become higher iq they tend to have lower birth rates and and systematically the world keeps correcting itself uh uh in many ways in dogmatic stuff like for example uh how many people would truly understand what jainism means and how many people have actually studied it versus following some ritual processes you don't know why they exist and why should they exist uh for example if you are, if you study history of jainism as a religion you will find out it was a, a rebellious behavior against people's belief in god right and it was supposed to be an atheistic approach towards life but then now we feel ke oh wo bol raha jai shri krishna so we should be saying something so we figured out oh we should say jai jinendra who the hell came up with that i don't think it was there in any book to be said these things and i think that's where the magical stuff of over a period of time uh, society self corrects to normalize to almost equality every now and then absolutely i think that's a very very uh, unique take um, kunal so i wanted to move the conversation on to uh, the fourth part which is cred mint and india's wealth driven society so with cred mint you've started a p2p lending platform for qualified users now this has existed informally in society for ages and so gujarati community marwadi community the money lenders lending to everyone now this is formalizing this in a way that is institutionalized now i'll go back to my hypothesis which please poke holes in that is that because of a lack in faith in institutions matlab india mein return of capital is tougher than return on capital trust is low so that we 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 lend in our community we only trust our community we don't trust the banks we have four crore cases that are outstanding in the court court mein jao kya karoge what are you going to do time lagega you're not going to be able to solve anything 
So how are you thinking of scaling this behavior change? I think this is fundamentally a DNA change that you're trying to change. I think it's a good point. First of all, uh, rewarding good financial behavior and, and thinking that that opens up my life dramatically is, is super important, right? Unless you think like that, you are not going to be interested in good financial behavior, right? And, and therefore, I'm, my view is that individuals are likely to behave much better than, let's say, businesses, hypothetically, because uh, uh, you, you can get away with a big thing and, and let's say you can get stuck in a legal case over there. But let's say an individual, right? Uh, what if, I'm just hypothesizing over here, for example, let's say you could not travel to any other country if you do not have a good credit score. What if you could not um, get insurance at a lower cost if you do not have a good credit score? What if uh, no landlord will rent you an apartment till you have a good credit score. And a lot of these things happen everywhere in the developed world. But for Indians, these things appear to be alien concepts. How do we look at a tenant and a landlord? They'll call you, we'll dress up nicely that day so that they don't judge us. We can't go in shorts and, and wear a torn t-shirt. We'll dress up properly. And women even see more pronounced behavior. They will dress up properly in Indian so that people don't think that they are doing some bad behavior in the apartment. How is this scalable? And by the way, after that, we take eight months deposit. And what do we do with that deposit? It keeps lying on our bank account. <laughs> so the view is that we really, really need to think about life in a very different way uh, for it to succeed. And, and I think the moment we change the markers of trust, right? For example, we don't need, how did India become so big on gold, right? And if you go to history of gold, you realize that India had probably 14 demonetizations in its history. And naturally we, we trusted gold a lot more because it was only currency that was free of regimes, right? Today, India has uh, approximately 15% of the world's gold in retail India. That's approximately probably $1.5 trillion or $1 trillion. I don't know what the number is. That's half of our GDP. And more interesting data is the second largest imported item in India after petrol or oil is gold. gold. So the question is that what are we really doing? Is gold an instrument of mistrust? And I think that's where it, things get tricky and, and intricate that do we have the trust in a regime to kind of do more and more and, and uh, and unless we think in that level of landscape, uh, we are likely to just think short term and get surprised. Uh, we, we should not forget that 10 years ago, most people did not have a smartphone. And uh, 15 odd years ago, most people had no clue what internet meant. And we don't even know what's going to come at the rate of every two, three years going forward. Absolutely. And I think people who don't adapt, you know, eventually will fall off the curve. And I think the point of gold raises a good segue into the consumption angle. Because gold was used as a, you know, safety and anti-volatile asset. If, you know, the government goes wild, if the currency goes wild, this is a safe haven. But now if you want to push a consumption-based economy, like the West, you know, living on credit, um, I know, I think we'll defer on this take right here that Indian weddings, right? We spend so much on weddings. Um, an Indian typical business family will spend on weddings, cars, houses. My argument is that during an Indian wedding, you're spending on, you're generating employment. You are pushing money in the system for DJs, choreographers, artists, etc. That's making money flow in the system. Um, do you think the West has got it right? You know, Black Friday sale, Thanksgiving sale, Christmas gift. They've centered an economy around consumption, which we do in terms of like weddings, as well as some festivals like, you know, Diwali. How do we scale a consumption model? The question is that, do we believe in it? 
first of all i don't know if india truly believes in consumption as a thing right uh, 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 for example i recently found out that uh, south korea used to give income tax rebates for spends on credit card so that tells me that they are super clear that this has to become a consumption economy and it has to grow do you think we would ever do something like that uh uh and and uh, for example upi has grown because it's made been made free is that capitalism <laughs> so the question is that do we truly understand how capitalism and consumption economy works my view is that uh the understanding of that is limited and which creates concentration of trust in a fewer entities right and therefore you will see conglomerates largely emerge in low trust nations right where one company can do salt from car to furniture to app and everybody uses it because you trust very few people right and i think unless we truly understand and uh, address it they are less likely to be successful right uh, and for us familiarity familiarity of faces brands bab ka bada building hai ki nahi hai are more important things right like for example jewelry stores that have huge doors tend to attract customers who don't bargain too much because we think that are ye to bade log honge but we don't know if they are really offering us pure gold or no pure gold we don't understand these things so my my worry is the nuances are something that will come when we are truly interested in these nuances are curious about people who are creating wealth are curious about wealthy societies right if you ask anybody is indian culture the best culture everybody will vehemently agree in india but if you ask them how many other cultures have you studied or experienced or been through the answer is zero so how do we know <laughs> so why why do we have this ego because everywhere again i'll take my example down to tier 2 india is a big tier you give someone izzat then doesn't matter what money everything is izzat is the main thing why why are we so insecure or why we do why do we have such an ego i think uh, every at, at humans at primitive level care a lot more about status and wealth is a trained behavior right because the the way to get prestige through wealth is a long path राइट वो बहुत मेहनत करना पड़ेगा काम करना पड़ेगा पढ़ाई करना पड़ेगा देन यू विल हैव अ कार देन यू विल हैव समथिंग बट लेट्स से आई मेक यू प्राउड अबाउट एनीथिंग इट्स द फास्टेस्ट हैक राइट इवन इन इन इफ यू लुक एट पॉलिटिक्स इट इज मच इजियर टू मेक पीपल प्राउड ऑफ देयर पास्ट देन वरी अबाउट देयर फ्यूचर राइट एंड देयरफॉर वी आर वी शुड नॉट बी सरप्राइज्ड व्हेन अ पॉलिटिक्स इज डन ऑन कास्ट और रिलीजन और लैंग्वेज or city name or subsection name because it gives you identity and pride in things that don't matter right and and you can easily own somebody and and control somebody if you can make them proud about their past it's very hard to get loyalty from people uh, when you make them insecure about their future so the question is that uh i'll give you a classic example like all this country every now and then people worry about petrol pricing ye wo right and i ask people that what is the what do you think the inflation is on pani puri's price in india how many x has pani puri's price gone up in the last 20 years versus petrol and we don't know but it is a topic to rebel against and this is the smartest people who are stuck on are petrol price itna bad gaya ye gad gaya but boss pani puri ka price kitna bad gaya nobody is in the math of that and and this is the same cohort which will go and spend let's say 2 or 300 rupees having a coffee somewhere right but i think the moment we make people not have the ability to think independently how many people in india can think independently and have a counter view right most people love to agree over here if you write anything on linkedin 200 people will say i agree i agree i agree you don't see that in any other culture of writing i agree 
so as a collective society affiliation is lot more important then questioning countering philosophy cannot thrive in a society right. where you are not interested in seeking truth do you think that changes so before we jump into the q and a do you think that changes with wealth creation once people become more individualistic i think you mentioned an example where living room furniture had 3x the margin of a uh, bedroom furniture because we like to show people that we are you know up there but individually we don't take care of ourselves so do you think as a per capita or median wealth rises this collectivist approach dissipates and is that are we ready for that say in 2045 when we are a credit fueled society individualistic it is only possible when we adopt capitalism in its entirety and not in parts uh you can't have credit fuel society and and also have mrp so are we a good point on that so when i was yeah. in the us i used to see the gas station the petrol pumps with the gas station opposite each other will have different prices and i was wondering ke bhai like it's in the same area they have different prices i go down 20 miles on the road is a different price and then also in india all prices of fuel are the same at all petrol pumps so where's the business right um but now that you contextualize it that mrp like why shouldn't some I, I imagine you you have a petrol pump in uh, south bombay or you have it in daisar chiknaka the cost of fuel is the same so rent kaise afford karoge yeah so we don't ask and question these things we are far away from realizing and understanding some of these things absolutely yeah gunal before we go into q and a i uh, wanted to ask do you have a hard stop at 7:30 yes that is true okay sounds good so what we'll do and if you don't mind uh, we go into a q and a section we allow people to unmute themselves are you okay with that or should we just read this yeah question? that's okay as long as somebody is moderating who should come otherwise everybody will start speaking together yeah 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 uh, so anup can you uh, kick start the q and a sure thanks uh, thanks kunal uh, for your time um let's uh, let's get since we have only 15 more minutes let's quickly get into it um rajesh uh, dume has a question for you about uh, startups i'll uh, ashay can you unmute un- 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 yeah rajesh you have... yeah go ahead yeah hi kunal uh, first of all uh, i think congratulations and i've uh, learned about your delta 4 theory it's brilliant because it talks about how the new solutions are far more efficient than the uh, what people were used to earlier and therefore there is a stickiness and certainly therefore it the consequence of that is the ubp that you call which is again a phenomenal term because everybody has been used to usp uh, ubp is unique packing pr- proposition the question that i have for you is uh, can i can i uh, start my video as well if you permit uh, uh, no we can just do in interest of time let's move on this the question is very simple uh, me and my twin brother we have started a consumer tech uh, company and the question is for how long we can continue to burn capital Uh, uh without uh, having a visibility on uh, profitability and uh, from the operations cash flow from the operation uh i think i think that's the question i have for you kunal uh sorry uh, technical issue can you repeat the question quickly if you don't mind yeah yeah i will i will just repeat the question quickly as i said we have launched the consumer tech company our question is for how long we can continue to burn capital without generating operating cash flows given that vcs and pes are now increasingly putting pressure on founders to generate profitability rather than just gmv gtv for example we work i don't think that statement is true if your distribution is growing at a healthy rate and and your cost of customer acquisition is dropping or staying stable and there is a potential to monetize which is quite evident uh, uh, there are many businesses that have uh, managed to keep the cost uh, of distribution high and all of that if your business fundamentally does not have uh, appetite of investors to support you for distribution or uh, your business does not seem to have the potential where you prove the monetization to prove that 
at scale this will make sense nobody is likely to support it so i don't think that is a true statement that increasingly people are asking that first of all we work uh, was called out because it was positioning itself as a tech business when it was purely a real estate business so i don't think this is a fair example sound good thanks kunal uh, anup uh, in the interest of time just read the questions yeah so so that we have maximize kunal's time oh okay. thank um um i think rashmi has a question here um the stock market seems to be unrelated to macro economic fundamentals even financial literacy may not help in these times how is fintech preparing educating consumer about eventual market corrections um that's a great question uh i i i often tweet about it personally i don't think fintechs uh, may necessarily be incentivized if your business is to get people to trade more buy more uh, and therefore i remain fundamentally conflicted that would i ever sell something that i would not tell my family to do uh and i think as a rule we've made a simple rule in the cred that we would not launch a product that we would not give it to our closest family members to use and buy and take care of for example cred meant that the product we launched uh which which gives you 9% uh, uh up to 9% to invest uh in other members of cred uh we launched it internally till 80% of our team members used it for three or months we did not launch it for public so our view is that uh we are doing the right safeguarding on ourselves but i don't know how you can prevent other people uh that's the role of a regulator but i don't think fintech and government necessarily incentivized to tell people to be cautious except putting that warning at the end uh uh and 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 i don't know uh if telling people to keep money in fixed deposit also a good idea at the same time so the question is that uh how do you teach a people discretion uh i i wish i knew better we are seriously considering how to invest uh as a company behind these things and hopefully in a few weeks or months we'll we'll come up with a program for that awesome thanks um yeah i mean i mean asset allocation is a big thing uh, uh speaking of which uh, capital mind uh, i i heard your podcast on it and i i was very your your the way you've done use credit score to build trust is a very interesting way of doing the p2p lending right um and yeah i mean that makes sense and dog fooding your own product before giving it to other other people um vinod has a question uh Uh, about again uh, literacy and fintech uh, teaching finance in schools can be a start but considering how teaching maths has worked it needs to start needs smart curriculum and interested teachers can we trust traditional teaching methods to do the job <laughs> can we trust traditional education to teach anything at all uh, so uh, it's a more fundamental question my question is slightly more fundamental uh, with zoom when millions of people can watch and learn why shouldn't the best math teacher teach math to everybody why shouldn't the best physics teacher teach physics to everybody uh and and are we likely to see a complete uh reform on education where ultimately uh the best one win i'll give you a small example and and this is maybe a terrible analogy but it's still relevant in the past in ancient times the person who used to entertain used to earn less than person who used to get entertained right but as they got stage they started becoming more wealthy and then the person who was on stage was sometimes earning equal amount of money than the person who was watching as the stages became bigger let's say television as a stage came up suddenly the person who was performing on television was making more money than most people who were watching television internet made this gap even bigger why hasn't that happened in education uh and and my view is that that's likely to happen uh and a lot of people will eventually want to learn with the best person and and it's only a matter of time uh where we may realize that uh uh we were not taught by the best in the world so kunal what does that do to 
the millions of other teachers on a local if everyone can learn from kunal shah what happens, what happens to the rest the artists used to do shows in gaos before now most people spend their time on some app and spending time they don't go and watch a lavni or a show what happened to them so the question is that every time a more efficient behavior will come and people have to change their professions same point um we have a more technical question so by shabham um where do you see india's fintech stack evolving to in the coming years so i think payments, i think first is uh, the first was forget about forget about the word fintech stack whatever anything that is inefficient will become more efficient that's it stop using all these labels fintech stack ai no everything that is inefficient and you feel the inefficiency will become efficient um so in, in five years and by the way even then you will feel it's inefficient right. so where do you where do you see the biggest opportunities that lie in enabling uh the next billion uh, all these of mission take a human motivation that people have at scale either in terms of desire or in terms of volume of people who have that desire and make it extremely easy for them to achieve that motivation uh, looking for a do mantra bata do ki ek do tip kaun sa business karna chahiye that's not never going to be a great way of building business the question is do you understand what do people want and can you make it really easy for them to achieve that absolutely uh, no we want to pick up the crypto question sure uh, a lot of people actually ask this uh, in the stack uh, umang and uh, amit uh, what is your take on cryptocurrency you said people don't understand it so should we and do quickly I'm add not to that I'm now not... sorry go ahead sorry uh, to quickly quickly add to that we were interviewing ashish shawn who's the bse md and ceo and he thinks it's a scam um he his his point was if anyone can mine it who owns it and if everyone can mine it then how is it actually a currency but yeah go ahead <laughs> i i'm not going to go into technicalities of it but i'll tell you one simple logical framework to think about um historically people were hiding their taxes by storing their wealth in real estate gold and so on and so forth now if you can figure out a way to put that in crypto and now go out of the country without any trace uh i i think the risk is even bigger on some of those things than worrying about isme invest karna hai ki nahi karna hai right a country can lose all its wealth in no time right it is not uncommon for business communities to have an option of getting pay cash and get crypto at 5% extra that's going to happen and and it happened with gold in the past but gold used to have a problem of smuggling and you can get stopped at the airport how will you stop crypto that's one two is uh i don't know i don't any own any crypto so i can not comment on this two point of is it a good investment asset or not but my view is very simple how does gold make sense it's a random metal that we all agree to assign value to so ultimately when humans agree to one protocol to create trust on it can be a country it can be a currency it can be a metal as and, and to me the answer is very simple uh, if the number of believers of the belief system is growing every day can we truly consider it to be a uh, anomaly and and who knows uh, uh, what scam means uh, uh, if if most people want to uh, how, how do we know a country is not a scam how do we know a currency is not a scam how do we know stock market is not a scam like the question is that there's a regulator that controls it in this case there is no regulator because it seems to be operating on human will in some ways and i don't know what that means it can have dangerous consequences for example a market operator could 
crash the price, take people's wealth away, and then increase the price again, which can be happening. I don't know. Uh, so the question is that uh, if you look at villages became cities, cities became countries, countries became bigger things by adopting common protocol. To me, crypto is same as English as a language. How are we all able to communicate in one language? It's a common protocol. We all have learned it and we've all accepted as a way of communication and we come from different backgrounds. I may be speaking Gujarati, Hindi, Marathi, uh, all these different languages that we have at home, but we agreed to a common protocol that seems to be English and the number of DAUs of English is growing every day in the world. If English was monetizable, our usage of English was monetizable, would we question that? Right, right. Uh, Nikunal, we are at time. Is I'm not answering the question because I don't know enough, but I can yeah. tell you one thing. When humans figure out a way to trust each other without help of third parties, crazy things have happened in history. Absolutely. I think, uh, Kunal, we are at time. So before we leave, uh, just one question and then we'll end it. This is what Peter, Peter Thiel also asks, is what is one universal truth that you believe that most people disagree with you? Uh, Peter Thiel has not told you that you should never tell this in public uh, and you should be building businesses on top of that. So the answer is that is if all that I know, I'll be building stuff on. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, Kunal. So Rekha, can you switch on your screen? Quick closing remarks and then we'll close this uh, interview. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kunal, for this, uh, I think... Uh, very insightful and thought-provoking session, I would say. I think you've left a lot of food for thought in the minds of all the, in my mind, and I'm sure in the minds of viewers. And I think they're all difficult uh, problems to solve, but I think we, we need to make a start by at least thinking through it and seeing, you know, uh, what we can, at least each one can do in their own, uh, you know, limited way. So thank you so much, Kunal, and thank you very much to all our viewers who have uh, joined us today. Thank you, Ashe and Anup. Thanks so thank much. Thank you. Peter. Okay. Thank you, Gunal. We'll send you the recording as well as the summary uh, shortly. Okay. And th thank, you. thank you to Ekta and Ankit as well for making this happen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.